tell a story on each one. We had 16 people there. Hey, I guess it's, it's the sunlight's driving them in, huh? Or well, I don't know <laughs> what it is. Amy and Gary's here, so they oh. came. And uh, Isaac was with them. Oh. William, well, he went out in Wasilla, but Isaac was there, and then Anne came to the, this time. He hadn't been here for a long time. Huh. And, uh, well, was Gary and Amy just here for a visit? For a few days, yeah. And uh, Greg and Liz were there. We had a pretty good bunch. Oh, have they been back there too many times? A few times they've come, yeah. Awesome. Seem to be good people. Well, Liz does. We knew Greg already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we knew him. You know, you know, we saw them. They were still on their honeymoon. We saw them walking on a trail. Um, I guess it was power line. Huh. <laughs> it was so funny. We were just walking along the trail. You know, we yeah. we got seven of us. We were all spread out and walking around and being loud and rambunctious like my kids are and we see this couple walking down and uh, we see them wave I'm like who is that that's great yeah. his new bride yeah they were I guess she was part of the Kirka family we knew the Kirkas from many many years ago they, were, they were part of the old Bethany bunch that we oh in. yeah okay. although she wasn't even born when we first knew them. <laughs> oh, wow. A long time ago. But so you knew her grandpa? Yeah, old Ralph and Alice Kirka. Kirka. K-U-R-K-A? Kirka, yeah. K-U-R-K-A. Kirka. Yeah. I, I said it like that because that sounds like a Russian name. Might be. I don't know. <sighs> How's the rest of your people? Well, Alicia's littlest guy, Ezekiel, fell off a oh. thing the other day and broke his arm, broke both of those oh. lower bones in the arm. Oh, a little buddy. That was uh, the day before yesterday, I guess. So they got him over to the hospital and they straightened it out, fixed him up, I guess. But you heard from uh, uh, Allison yet? Allison, who's that? Uh, that's her last name. Uh, Allison. The fella who was in jail for a while, prison. I guess I can't think who you're talking about. Friend of Alicia and Max's. Oh, oh, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah. Not, uh, yeah, okay. That's a surname. Her his name was, was uh, PJ or something like that. Yeah, CJ. Uh, that's, CJ. That's, that's her name. Clayton. 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 Oh, yeah, Clayton. yeah. I have not heard from him directly, but I've heard about him, and I guess they're doing okay. I'm not sure what they're doing out there with him. It's usually a tough time when you get out of prison. Yeah. He was in there, what, four? Three, four years? Three or four years. I'm not sure a long time. Another one of I bet he knows the number of days, doesn't he? I suppose. Examples of the so-called justice system of the world. Yeah. Boy, this crazy Biden administration is just going mad. They're here intoxicated with power. He signed into laws that these transgender guys can compete with with the gals in girls sports in schools now. Yep. All he has to do is say he's a woman and then he can jump in there and they can go into any bathroom, locker room, wherever they want, you know. Yep. And this guy somehow crazy Joe Biden thinks that's something that we need in this country. Yeah. The guy's just absolutely out of his mind. Yeah, he is. He's being directed by demonic spirits. That's right. Like well, but it'll occur, the curse will come back down on him. It's done it so far. Right. It's almost as if every single thing that he's put into 
practice. You can't call it law. Nice. Everything he's put into an order yeah. just tells who he is. Well, that number 20 that we're talking about, you know, I gave a few examples in there of different places where the number oh. 20, there's many, many of them, but I picked out four or five of them. But um, Joseph, Patriarch Joseph, was sold by his brothers into slavery for 20 pieces of silver, 20 shekels or something like that. Yeah. So, to him, what does 20 mean? <laughs> Price of betrayal. Yeah, and what did, make, what did the 20 make him into? A slave. A slave. Or a servant. So when Yeshua was born in the world. You got somebody passing you. Me. I see him, yeah. When he was born in the world, what did he become? Servant. Servant or a slave, right? Yeah. In fact, his uh, his prayer to get the Father in, in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane is... Uh, we don't do anything by my will. We do everything by your will because I am a servant yeah. of the Father. So what does 20 mean to the Lord? <laughs> honoring the Father. Well, it's more than honoring the Father. It's being sold as a slave, isn't it? Yeah. Now, he was sold to the Pharisees for 30 pieces, which was the price of a female slave. Why would he take the price of a young male slave? Which is 30 or 20? 20. One for him, and one for the bride? Well, he is he is sold as a slave, so yeah. and he's a young male, so he's going to bring the price of a young male. So They're not supposed to stop. I know. So. I'm letting them go <laughs> if they want to, but if they don't want it, they can stop. I guess she wants to stop. Yeah, okay. well. I'll just take advantage of it. <laughs> <laughs> Got to flow with the go yeah. sometimes. And there's other places, many of the, you know, in, in Israel, ancient Israel, you had the northern tribes and the southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And in the southern tribes, they had, all of them, they had uh, many different kings there in both the tribes. The southern tribes, how many of the kings could qualify as good kings? <laughs> In the southern tribe? Yeah. That's Judah and that's Benjamin. That's Judah, right? Judah um, and Benjamin. Not yeah. too many of them. Do you know how many? Was it five? Five, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I think we talked about and it. And they last weren't week. perfect by any means. They were, they had what we call pretty good kings. You know? <laughs> yeah. But at least they had some redeeming value. David was called a man after God's heart, and yet he was a murderer, wasn't he? Yeah. And yeah. Hezekiah was Alter. a very good king, but he had his problems. And yeah, I read about him since Asa we talked about Asa was a good one. Um, I think he's the one who said he he walked in all the ways of his father David but the high places weren't taken away. So there's always a butt comes in there, you know. And then you had uh, Uzziah. Uzziah was a good king for Israel, but Jer uh, Isaiah <laughs> didn't really see the Lord until Isaiah, until Uzziah died. What do we got in there? A little there? coffee ice. Oh, okay. <laughs> I saw something in there and it didn't look right. So the Leftover coffee. I decided to wipe it out because I didn't want it One to be a rock I'll or anything. Take that cup in and wash it, I guess. <laughs> Oh, why do that? Yeah. Why ruin the flavor yeah. The flavor it's got going on? <laughs> but anyway, he had five pretty good kings in, in but in the northern tribes, uh, of, which was called Israel, how many good kings were in that bunch? Zero. Every one of them were thugs. Every one of them. There was not a good king there. And uh, quite a few of them either entered at royalty at age 20 or they served for 20 years. Huh? 
quite a few of those evil kings oh. either started being a king at age 20 or they were the king for 20 years. How about that? I never noticed that number. Yeah, you go. thank you. Cheers. So what does 20 mean to those kings? Power. Rulership. Yeah. But really the number 20 belongs to the Lord. So when an evil king uses 20, it's part of his his description. It's like using and misusing that royal position. 20 is a, is a number that means servitude, being a servant to God is what 20 is. But when these evil kings got that number 20 tacked onto their name, it's like a position which should be righteous and, and valuable, but it serves only the enemy. So sometimes what should be honorable is twisted around to become dishonorable, isn't it? Mm, yeah. You know, when the Ark of the Covenant was rescued from the Philistines after they had captured it, they brought it back to a place called Kerith Jerem. Uh -huh. Kerith Jerem means a city of forests. In other words, obviously it was a city within a forest of trees, apparently. And you look at what was the problem in the Garden of Eden? Um, man chose not to listen to God. Or and how did he go about doing that? He listened to the evil one. But what did he do? What did he do? Yeah. He uh, twisted his words. He did much more than that. What did he, act, what did he do he physically? What disobeyed did he do? God. He, huh? He disobeyed God. What he, did he do? He, Tell me what he did. He, sure he disobeyed. What? What did he do? He ate aid of forbidden fruit. That's right. He misused one of the trees of the garden, did he not? Yeah. Where was another tree used in a very, very shameful way? The crucifixion of the Lord. That's right. So, Kirith Jerem is called the city of forests. And there they brought the ark and put it in a place and it was there for 20 years. Hmm. And while it was there, the house of that man who was taken to was blessed continually for the yeah. 20 years. Yeah. So somehow, when the ark was put in trees out of honoring God, it brought blessing. But when it was, the trees were misused in the Garden of Eden, it brought a curse on the whole planet, did it not? Mm -hmm. Now, so the Lord was put on a tree in order to restore us. So that ark was placed in place of Kerith Jer Jerem for 20 years. So what does 20 mean to Kerith Jerem? Blessings. The blessing of God by putting the ark in the forest of trees to honor God. Somehow that number 20 there could represent again honoring God and receiving blessing because of it, wouldn't it? Yeah. Samson ruled as a judge in Israel for 20 years. When you think of Samson, what first thing comes to mind? Somebody talks about Samson, what does it mean? Strength. Strength. What else? His full heartedness. Yeah. What did Samson seem to like doing more than anything else? <laughs> he liked the foreign women. Yeah, he was a woman as a playboy, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. He also liked beating up Philistines, which he was good at. Yeah. But his name, do you know what the name Samson means? I don't recall right this one. I put it right in there. Oh, splendid sun, joy, radiance, enlightenment. Yeah. How Sun's did Samson die? <laughs> the opposite of all those. How did he die? He was in shackles and he died when he tore the house down. What house? The, I don't know, I guess it was a party house. <laughs> well, it was I, the, I know it was, it was the temple a to temple, the, yeah. To these uh, Philistines. And, and yeah, had the pillars. What condition was he in when he did that? 
He was blind. Yeah. And, blind. And shackled. But his name means glorious sunshine or sunlight, being enlightened, being able to radiate light. Does that sound like blindness? <laughs> no. What was his final prayer? The Lord revisits his strength. Yeah. He actually prayed to God. What did he ask God for? To recover his strength for just a moment. For what purpose? To destroy the enemy? Yeah. And uh, so here Samson ruled for 20 years. 20 years. So what does 20 mean to Samson? Huh. You take all the what you just said about Samson and you culminate it. His last words were his prayer to God, and God granted his last prayer. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think? Did Samson, is he one of the Lord's people or not? Yeah. What did he mostly do that seemed to counter that? To counter that? Yeah. Um, you just said he was one of the Lord's people. Yeah. Um, well, the Lord proved that he was one of the Lord's people by answering his prayer and yeah, he but did turn his heart to God. But what did he do that countered the idea that he could be one of the Lord's people? <laughs> Pretty much everything else. <laughs> so the, the self-righteous Pharisees, how would they judge Samson? Condemnation. Why? Because he didn't do righteousness. Yeah, he, he spends his life chasing women and beating up Philistines. How much gospel preaching did Samson do? <laughs> None. How do you, do you ever read about him offering a sacrifice to God? No. Yes, you do. Not unless that you count that temple destruction. Is that what you count? Well, what did he do at that temple? Well, he gave his life up. That's gave sure. his life up for what? For the destruction of many of the enemy. Yeah, and he got the ability to do it through what means? The energy of God. Yeah, he he asked God for the ability to get vengeance on these enemies, and he got it. So, in some way, even though he doesn't appear to usually live like what we would like to think is a holy, pious man, yeah, he really was God's man. And even though he is a, a womanizer and a lot of things about him that that uh, the holiest of all people would condemn quickly, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. Yet, what, what, was he doing what God wanted him to do? Why did God raise up Samson in the first place? To judge the people? Yeah, he and he led the people for 20 years. So when we read about him, do we get much of a 20-year coverage of his life when we read it? Not really. We read it's about a, a few, few episodes. A few things that happened during those 20 years. They could have all been done in a matter of a few weeks, couldn't they? Right. So how much of that 20 years do we really know anything about? <laughs> just a portion, a small portion. Yeah, very just a, just a little corner of it. But nevertheless, he reign, reigned for 20 years. So could... Let's give a, a example. How would you think 20, what does 20 mean to Samson? We're talking about the number 20. He reigned for 20 years. I'd say completion of, a, of his work. Yes, and uh, even though what we read about would get the disapproval of most self-righteous people, nevertheless, he was Israel's judge for 20 years, and... Uh, and he destroyed the power of much of the enemy. So, you know, when the Pharisees saw the Lord crucified, what did they say about him? He what trusted the, in the Lord, mocking him. Yeah. Remember Isaiah 53 talks about it. In Isaiah 53, what is the description of the Lord that was given? <laughs> Basically the whole chapter. No, I'm talking about, I'm thinking about 22. 
But yeah. 53 says, we 50, thought what? 53. That God had cursed him? Yeah, we thought he's just dying for his own sins. He's yeah. getting what he deserves. So when, he, when Isaiah wrote that, that's what we thought. Yeah. Of course, that was written hundreds of years before the actual event of the crucifixion. Yeah. But he's describing exactly what the Pharisees would say, wouldn't he? Yeah. So what did the Pharisees say about the Lord dying? Isaiah just said it. Yeah. What did they that. say? Um, he's dying because he's guilty. He's just getting his what he deserves, yeah. right? But that line is followed with the word but. But what? But he suffered for our sins. Yeah. He wasn't getting what he deserved. He got what we deserved. Right. You know? But he's getting it. So you could say, could you say in some way the same thing about Samson? We look at Samson dying in the Philistine temple with all those other Philistines and all his life and the self-righteous people could say he's just getting what he deserved yeah but why did samson die if all those philistine priests had lived what do you think they would have done if they had lived kept on doing paganism and what would that accomplish <laughs> nothing oh yes it would it accomplish a lot what do false prophets do? Lead people to destruction. Yes. So if they had lived, they would have led how many people to destruction? Maybe. No telling them. Could it be? Who knows? There was hundreds of them. But one man, Samson, laid his life down that they might not be able to do that. So could you say in a way, just as Isaiah said, he died for our transgressions. Hmm. Could we say that Samson died to protect us from the evil that would have come from those false prophets. Yeah, I can see that. So, in some ways, even though there's room for the self-righteous people to condemn Samson, if we look at it, why did the Lord tell us about Samson anyway? Why did he go to the bother to write all about Samson? <laughs> I don't know, maybe to tell somebody that... Uh, something I learned from was it Luke chapter what is it 12 3 or something like that mm -hmm. 13 3 where he said repent or you will all likewise perish yeah I think his message there what you know because he talked about a couple of different groups yeah. that were known mm -hmm. amongst everybody as being the worst of the worst yeah and he was saying repent lest you likewise perish. Yeah. He was saying, you're no better than the worst that you know. Yeah. Maybe that's why God was Could be. Me. Well, certainly there's some warnings in Samson's story. Yeah. Uh, you don't you don't negotiate with the enemy. When he, when his girlfriends yeah. draw, tried to draw the truth out of him, he kept playing games with him. You know, first yeah. he pretended to give him the real answers they did, but Every time he gave him an answer, he went closer and closer to the truth. It proved that she was a liar. Yeah, until he finally caved in and told her the whole thing, and that cost him. But So that serves as a warning. But on the other hand, could you say the same thing about King David? Here he brought down the death of one of his most faithful soldiers in order to steal the guy's wife, and then his own son through her died. So here's David, the man after God's heart, could his story give us a warning as well? Oh, yeah. So just because a guy does something he shouldn't do, even that could be beneficial for us. So in the long run, when it says David was a man after God's heart, what made him get a title like that? That's a wonderful title, <laughs> a man after God's heart. What it, gave him the right to wear that title? It's the good things he did. It's the turning his heart to God. Okay, so could we give that title to Samson? Yeah. Why? Because he turned to God there at the end. He laid his life on the line yeah. to save people from the, he knew where the evil turn. of that, of those evil uh, priests of Baal. So. Because if anything, through his story. I mean, he knew more than anybody 
Yeah. That the Lord was the one who gave him his power. Yeah. So, so Samson ruled for 20 years. So you might say in, in his story, the 20 years showed us how the grace of God works. Is that right? Yeah. So when we see that number 20, quite often we're going to be seeing what it is that the grace of God does. You know, back at John 8:39. Uh-huh. That's the one that says the Lord speaking to the Pharisees said you guys are always studying the scriptures. Yeah. Because you think in them you have everlasting life. So which scriptures were they studying? Same ones. Which the, ones? The Torah, the Tanakh. Any particular ones? They were studying all of them. Okay, they studied all of them. So the Lord said, these scriptures that you're studying are really about me. So which scriptures are about the Lord? All of them. So if you read about Samson, what are you reading about? Something about the Lord. If you read about uh, Jacob, what are you reading about? The Lord. If you're reading about David and Goliath, what are you reading about? <laughs> That's the These the scriptures Lord. are about me. Yeah. Now they... They're like everything is a parable, you know. Yeah. So if you, if you look at the, uh, the scripture itself. Remember, every parable has a surface, yeah, vision and a, and a hidden depth. So. Uh -huh. So if you look at the story of David and Goliath, on the surface, what are you looking at? On the, the story, surface. David and Goliath. <laughs> so what are you what are you seeing on in the story? You seen a giant and a little and a boy and a, a young guy killing a giant, right? Yeah, that's right. You see the doubting king who didn't think he could do it, and all that. Well, a parable is fine if you look at the surface. A surface of a parable is true, isn't it? Yeah. However, what's the matter with that? It's just surface. It's not deep enough yet. Yeah, and so if you don't get into the depths of it, it doesn't really mean much to you. It, it's true enough, and you can probably understand it. You could, you could read the story of David killing Goliath and not have too much trouble understanding what happened. But if that's all you get out of it, what does it do for you? What, it, what is, how does that do anything to your life? <laughs> it's just an About old an story. About an story of yeah. something that happened thousands of years ago. That's right. So it really doesn't mean anything. But if you look in the depths of it, you see this is a picture of the Lord destroying his enemy. Yeah. In order to save us from the effects of that enemy. Kind of like what Samson did. He destroyed the enemy to keep them from affecting us. And so it goes on. Now, uh, Genesis 31 it's written in there somewhere down there. You need to look that one up and read it. I got it. Oh, hurt my neck this morning. <laughs> I think it's right down near the bottom here. Somewhere Genesis 31 something. Genesis 1831? No, I don't, I don't think they're. Sodom? No, part, back here in the beginning somewhere. See if you can see it down there. Didn't see it. That's why I flipped it over. We got Second uh, Kings, First Samuel, fourteen, First Samuel seven. Well, maybe it's way at the end, down in here somewhere. Okay. Yeah. This is eighteen thirty-one. I don't see thirty. Eighteen. Then maybe that was it. I was thinking it was thirty-one. Is it the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Nope. Well, you want me to look up 30 and see what it is? Let me see. I thought... Bear with me a minute. That's uh, like Judah and Tamar, isn't it? Nope, that's not it.
30 is Rachel and the children and Jacob's prosperity, Laban. Okay, that's it. Laban? Yeah. Okay. I better get my headlamp. Ow. I thought I had a vision in here. Oh, here. No. Genesis 18.31 is pr I'm praying for Sodom. And part of his prayer was if there was 20 righteous, Sodom would be saved. Yeah. So 20 for Sodom, what would that represent? For Sodom? Yes. <laughs> well, Magic number of salvation. It would be a number for salvation. <clears throat> yeah. But since there weren't 20 there, there was no salvation. The Lord said if there was 20, I'd save it. So there aren't. So uh, what we're looking for is where Jacob was talking to his father-in-law. I sure thought yep. it was. Well, I got it right here. Okay, what it's, does it it's say? It's not on it. I didn't see it on the sheet. I sure thought it was um, on it. Okay. Here it is. Oh, you found it. 38, ah, 31, verse 38 through 41. You That's were, the one. You were sure? Yes. And my eyes were not. I don't know why I'm in that. There it is. Chapter 31, verse 38 through 41. 31? 38? 41. All right. Remember, we're looking at number 20. How many verses? 8 to 31? That's a whole page. 38 through 41. 30, oh, 38 through 41. All right, here we go. Word of the Lord. These 20 years I have been with you, your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, and I have not eaten the rams of your flocks. What was torn by wild beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. From my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was by day, the heat consumed me, and the cold by night, my sleep fled from my eyes. These twenty years I have been in your house. I served you fourteen years for your two daughters, and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages ten times. Okay, you see three different numbers in there. Yeah. What are the three numbers? Um, twenty. Twenty. What Fourteen. Was, what was twenty? What was about twenty? The double authority of well, God. What, what, what did it say about 20 there? You just read it. Oh, the 20 years was uh, the whole the whole number of years he was in his house. Okay, 20. Now that's how long he was there. Now what's another number? 14. Okay, what's, what was it for 14? The years he worked for the two daughters. Okay, now, and then the third number? Six. Not six. That's what it says, six. Ten? Where'd you see six? Six years for your flock. Oh, yeah, okay. Six, all right. And ten. And you've changed my wages ten times. Okay. If someone changes your wages, <laughs> who's in charge? <laughs> the guy who's changing the wages. That's right. He's he's really, in a way, ruling over you, is he not? Oh, yeah. And he, By changing I, your wages. I don't imagine he changed them to the good. Either way, though, he's he's ruling over you. Yeah. All right. So, what does the number ten mean in Hebrew? Authority. And rule. Authority. So that one who changes the wages has has the authority to do so. Now, what does fourteen mean? Um, twice perfection. Yeah, twice perfection. Seven is absolutely perfect. 14 is double that, so if something is perfect, that's, you can't beat perfect, but what if it's doubly perfect? <laughs> I mean. That it, sets the seal on it. Yeah, it, it just boosts it into a, a much higher realm. So, um, and then a third number is 20. So he served him for 20 years, and this that number six there, had to do with the animals, didn't it? Yeah. All right. Now he said, if anything happened to one of those animals, who paid the price? He did. He said, I bore the loss. 
So here's the Lord in Isaiah 53. Uh, what did he do in 53? <laughs> he bore the loss. He bore the loss. Can you see that that t number 20 t in Jacob's story is a picture of of bearing the loss for anything that didn't make it, right? Yeah. He, t he paid the price. How about the number 14? What was he doing for 14? Working for his wives? Yeah. So when the Lord came to earth, what did he come here for anyway? <laughs> he was working for his wife. Getting a bride, wasn't <laughs> a wife, he? wife, yeah. And so the 14 represents the effort that he did to get a, a bride. Yeah. The That's number good. number six there represents just the animals, the, the humans that are in the world, the man that is here. But what did Jacob do for the six? Um, he worked for the animals. Well, what does it say about number six there? You just read it. Six years for your flock. Okay. So, when it says the Lord died not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Yeah. So if he died for our sins, what was he obtaining for that? What was he getting for dying for our sins? Um, I don't know. Death penalty. Well, what did what did he he went to he went to do it for a purpose? What was he uh, doing for salvation or redemption? For getting a bride, right? Yeah. Exactly what the fourteen years were about. Yeah. But it wasn't just for the bride. He died for the sins of the whole world, like all the other animals, even the ones that... The that creation. Jacob just called them the number six, just the humanity itself. Even if they're not part of the bride, was his death for them too. Yeah. Yeah. So they're not part of the bride, so they don't come under the 14, but he still served them. So Jacob said even the other animals who... He kind of separated them off in a separate group. I served six years just to take care of them. And uh, so overall, the number 20, what do you see in number 20 there? He did this for 20 years, all this. Why did he do it? Prosperity, fruitfulness. Well, for his wives, it was love, but. Remember what the Lord told Nicodemus in John 3. Everybody knows it. God so loved the world, he did what? He gave his only begotten son. For what? For salvation. Yeah. So for 20 years, Jacob was there to save what was Laban's, wasn't it? Yeah. To get a bride for himself, to, rest, to take care of his animals for him. And all his service was for Laban's good, wasn't it? Yeah. But Laban did not appreciate it very much, did he? No, he didn't see it that so way. So he didn't see it that way. But why? So we even, could say. Even when he left, he, he threatened him, saying, Why yeah. have you done me wrong? Mm hmm. Remember when the patriarch Joseph went out to see about his brothers? Why did he go? Did he just wake up one morning and say, I think I'll go check on my brothers? Um, no, the, the brothers came to him, right? No, they didn't. No, they were out there tending sheep way off somewhere. And Joseph went out to see how they were doing. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I was thinking about why the latter he, end of the story. <laughs> why did he go? Oh, uh, to, to kind of like tend them as sheep, right? Well, that's what he was going to do, but why did he do it? Because his dad told him to. His dad sent him out there, didn't he? Right. His father said, go see how your brothers are doing. Yeah. So when Yeshua came to earth to be born, did he just wake up one morning and say, I think I'll go down and see how all the people are doing on earth? <laughs> no. Why did he come here? His father told the him. The father to. sent him. Yeah. That's that's important to that. 
So he was... He went out there to check on his brothers, and of course they ended up selling him for twenty shekels, and they oh, made him into a slave. Yeah. So, if you look at that, he became a slave because the father sent him into this ministry. Isn't that right? Yeah. So, who made him into a slave? Well, in a roundabout way, the father did, right? What do you mean a roundabout way? And the only way. The brothers had their part in it, but they were just puppets in the game. Weren't they? Did they think, did they have any idea what they were doing? No. Did they know that they were selling the, the very patriarch who was going to save the whole world from famine? Did they have any idea that it would come to that? No. Did they, even he, he his knows. father Jacob, did he know that? No. But Even the Torah said as much. That but they had been given a, a sort of a parable of it in the dreams that Jacob or Joseph had, remember? Yeah. About them bowing down to him and everything. Yeah. And uh, But the whole thing came down to it that God was sending Joseph into Egypt to make him into a slave. For what purpose? Well, so he could save everybody. Yeah. Who was saved by it? Everybody, the whole world. That's right. So, so you had uh, you had God sending the Son, and so you can see that that twenty shekels that He was sold for, again, twenty could represent God sending His Son to do a marvelous work. So, would twenty be a good number for salvation? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Of course, there's a lot more in there about 20s. It goes on and on many times, but the letter, this number 20th letter is resh. What does resh mean? It means a head. Mm -hmm. Need some more? Yeah, I'd take a little more. <laughs> you want it now? Or? Might as well. All right, let's see. Okay, resh means a head. Yeah. What's the first letter in the Bible? The first letter. B? Bait. Bait, yeah. Yeah, Hebrew. <laughs> and Sorry, what, I English. What does uh, bait mean? It means a, a house. A house. But this is a, a extra large bait in the way it's written in the Torah <laughs> scrolls. Yeah, it is. It so is. what does that make it? Why do they capitalize or make it bigger than all the other letters? To show its royalty? Well, it makes it the most important or the greatest house. Yeah. So it's it's not just any house. Not every house. Bait right, could right. mean any house, but when it's written in the Torah scrolls, it doesn't mean just any old house. It means the greatest of all houses. So that's the first letter. What's the first syllable in the Bible? Syllable is part of a word. Bera. That's two syllables. Ah, be. Bar. 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 What does bar mean? Sun. Sun. Who's the sun in the greatest house? Yeshua. Yeah. He's not. He's the sun. But the, what's the next syllable after bar? Resh. Resh. What does resh mean? Head. So this is the son in the great house, thus the head of the house. Is there any doubt about who it's talking about? <laughs> uh, no. Okay. So Yeshua is building a house. He's the creator. In John 1, it says he is the creator of all things. Nothing was ever created that he didn't create. Colossians says that he is the creator of all things. And whatever there is, whether there's principalities or rulers or anybody else, those are worth looking up. Have you looked at Colossians one up lately? Not lately. Okay. Let me see. I can't see this in the dark. Um, so on that side? John 1, 3 first, and then Colossians 1, 16 and 17. All right. We'll go to John first. John 1, 3. 
I visited this just this afternoon. Did you? Yeah. One, three. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. All right, so whatever you're seeing out there, <laughs> how to get to be. <laughs> made through Yeshua. Okay, now Colossians 1, verse 16 and 17. Colossians 1, 1, 16 and 17, I think. 16 and 17. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. Okay, first of all, where does that tell you everything is? Uh, say what? When it says in heaven and in the earth, what is he talking about? Everywhere. In Hebrew, it would be Hashemim Ve'eretz. Uh-huh. So where is all that? <laughs> Everywhere in this inhabitable earth. We have one word we use for it. Universe. Un universe. Yeah. Okay, now go on. Visible and invisible. In other words, for by him, all things were created visible and invisible. Okay. There are some things that exist that you can't see, aren't there? Yes. Like what? Like atoms. Atoms, you can't see air, you can't see gas, you can't see steam. Right. Lots of things you can't see. You can't see ideas, you can't see <laughs> understandings. Yeah. There's lots of things you can't, can't see. Can't see. You can't see someone's heart attitude, can you? No. So go on, what else? For by him all things were created, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Okay, the world's had lots of rulers and authorities, haven't they, and thrones? Yep. Remember we read in southern Israel, during the time of the kings, there were five of them that would be called good kings, or pretty I'd say pretty good kings. <laughs> in the northern kingdom, there were none. Which one of those kings were created by God? All of them. It says all of them, right? Yeah. And there are many rulers. Adolf Hitler was a ruler. Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Joseph Biden. Joe Biden. There are many people who are called rulers or authorities. Where'd they come from? Appointed by God. They're satanic powers, demons. Remember, Pontius Pilate said to the Lord, don't you know that I have power over you? Where'd Pontius Pilate come from? <laughs> he was appointed by God. When Pharaoh enslaved all the Hebrews and made them slaves for 400 and some years, where'd he come from? By God. God said, I raised you up. You mean to tell me that God creates evil things? He uses them for his power. That wasn't my question. Does God create evil things? Yes. Yes, he does. How can a righteous God create evil things? That's a tough question, isn't it? I didn't have any trouble asking. <laughs> I thought it was easy. <laughs> yeah. Why are you having trouble with it? Well, it's just a... It's... Well, you just told me he created everything, and the book says he created everything that is. Whether it, Does it say the, he created the good stuff? It says he created all stuff. How about poisonous plants? Did he create that? Yes, he did. Did he create disease viruses? Yeah. yeah. You mean to tell me that God creates bad stuff? The righteous God creates yes. evil things? That's right. The answer is absolutely yes. Yeah. It says right doubt. there, everything that is, everything that's ever been, how does it cover the heavenly realms, yeah. the spirit realms, yep. everywhere, where the demons live? It created that. He created this thing called Sheol with the place of death. Yeah. Whatever there is, where did it come from? Came from God. How many creators do we have? Only one. So whatever exists, it says, doesn't it say right there in Colossians, whatever there is, and John wrote the same thing, whatever exists, God created it. Right. So the question is, why would the righteous God create bad things? <laughs> 
That's not for us to decide why. I'm not deciding. It says why he did it. For example, in Pharaoh's case, said, For this reason I raised you up. Why did Pharaoh come into being? The Lord said, For this reason I raised you up. To let those people go. No, that's not what it was. <laughs> that's not what it said. Don't you know that verse? He quoted out of the, out of I think for I forget where he quoted maybe, Exodus or somewhere. But he says, "For this purpose I raised you up, that I might show my power in you." Yeah. So if you're going to show something that has power, if you wanted to sell a bulldozer to somebody, you had a D8 cat and you wanted to sell it, and somebody had comes to look at it, and said, "How much power does this baby have?" How do you sh demonstrate his power? Uh, move a mountain. You push it up something that is able to resist it, don't you? Yeah. If you use it, a bulldozer to push that stop sign over, here, let me show you what it can do. I'll knock the stop sign down. Does that demonstrate the power of a D8 cat? No. If you want to demonstrate that cat's power, what do you have to do? you got to put it up against a... <laughs> a noble, noble opponent. Yeah, you got to find something very, very tough to shove to demonstrate like if, the power. If David went up against a regular guy that wouldn't show anything. Would it, it? it wouldn't be a story. Yeah. So he goes against a giant. So the Lord raised up Pharaoh to show his power so he gets something that is so tough and so strong. It says God hardened his heart. It doesn't mean that God made him evil. It means God toughened one that was already evil. He'd already created him as an evil man. But as an evil man, if God walked up to anybody and did like that, what would happen? <laughs> disappear. They just disappear. Yeah. He says, I want to show my power in you. So in order for me to show my power, you got to be really tough. Yeah. So he toughened him. Yeah. He made him so tough that he could actually resist God. Yeah. Could Pharaoh stop God? Mm -mm. Couldn't stop him, but he could put up a very effective resistance, couldn't he? Which he did. Plus, he was the most well-known power in the world at the time. Mm -hmm. And yes, God had more power than him. And how many times did God use him for the demonstration? Till he was no. finished with him. How many? <laughs> um, at least 10. Not at least 10, 10. 10, okay. 10 to a show his What does 10 mean? It means 10 authority. means authority. Yeah. So he uses 10 times to show how Pharaoh is resisting that authority. So to Pharaoh, what does 10 mean? Defeat. Oh. What's it mean to Pharaoh? It means the end of his. Uh, no, order. what does it mean to him? What does he think it means? Ten. It means authority. So what does Pharaoh think? His authority. I'm the authority. Yeah. Didn't he say, who is God that I was to resist? Right. Obey him. I'm the authority here. Yeah. yeah. So the ten was to demonstrate. His authority. Who really is the authority? It's either yeah. you, Pharaoh, or it's God. <laughs> That's right. When Pontius Pilate said to the Lord, I have power over you, God said, the Lord said to him, the only power around here belongs to God. It's not yours. How much power did, Pharaoh, did Pontius Pilate have? Well, he had the regional power. He had a lot of power, but it was only what God gave him. Yeah. So how much power did Pontius Pilate have of his own? Oh, of his own, zero. Zero, no power. But the power of God was right there. Now, the Lord said to Pius Pilate, Yes, you're, you're, you have some authority, but it's not your authority. It's the authority that my Father's given you. For whose purpose? For your purpose? For my part. For his purposes. Yeah, for so instead of you having power for him, he's giving you some power to use you to serve his interests. So you're going to be doing what you don't want to do. In fact, Pontius Pilate tried to get out of doing this, didn't he? He struggled against doing it. Is that because he's a righteous man? No. How much does he care about Yeshua? <laughs> None. Well, then why did he beat his way around trying to get out of doing it? His wife warned him in a dream. Is that why he did it? <laughs> No. What tipped the balances when he was arguing with the Pharisees? I don't want to do this. Yeah, 
fear, fear of Caesar. Well, what did right. they say to him? They said, uh, if you don't deal with this, we're going to go over your head. You can't be a friend of Caesar. Yeah. And if you're not Caesar's man, what's going to happen to you? <laughs> He's going to get thrown out on his ear. He'll find out what crucifixions do, wouldn't he? <laughs> yeah. They crucified their enemies. Yeah. And, of course, it was fear, but the whole idea of it was that... Uh, it was a shaky world back then. Yeah. So when... He didn't have any power at all. He had, As far as the world goes, he had some authority, but as far as reality goes, he didn't have any power at all, did he? No. And when once he got done with what the Lord said he's given him power to do, what happened to Pontius Pilate after that? We don't have a record. As far as we're concerned, he just disappears and he's done. Yeah. He did the thing that God raised him up for, and now he's gone. Yeah. So, so here's all these evil forces that are there. And uh, the re I asked the question, why does God create evil things? There's a place where the Lord says, I create good and I create evil. He said that. One of the prophets wrote that. Why does he do it? Well, I know when you're talking about human choice, it's to give us uh, another road to take. That's right. My answer is he did it because he's honest. Huh, that's good. And he's asking you to choose. If you don't have alternates, what's there to choose? That's right. You know, in the old Russian Soviet system, they had democratic free elections, <laughs> and you were free to come and vote there. You can vote for Vladimir or else. <laughs> yeah. The problem was there was no choice, whether there was no right. alternate. Here's the candidate. You vote for him. It doesn't matter how you vote. It's always for that guy. <laughs> and so an honest election, you have to have an alternative, don't you? Yeah. If you don't have an alternative, then it's not a fair choice. And God says that, our relationship with him was based on our choice. Now, it's salvation comes through the grace of God, but he applies that salvation to us when we choose to receive it, doesn't he? Yeah. If he doesn't give you an alternate, then you're not a chooser, you're just a puppet. Yeah. You know, you take a puppet hanging on strings. When the puppet raises his arm, why does he raise his arm? <laughs> because the puppeteer did it. Puppet tear jerks a string and his arm goes up. Yeah. Another string, his leg moves. The puppet makes no choices. Does 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 the choice? Does the puppet have a will involved in it? No. no. He just does whatever the string jerks him to do. That's not what God wants. He doesn't want a bunch of puppets. He wants people who have chosen to obey him because that's what they want. And so, in order to have that, he has to provide an alternate. But he also provides ample instructions and he begs us don't go that way that's not the good way that is not for your good that's the that'll bring your destruction but you must still choose so is everyone obligated to choose truth no if they were obligated to choose truth it wouldn't be a choice it wouldn't be a choice they'd all choose truth wouldn't they yeah but that's yeah. not what god wants they'd just be puppets so he says Here's the alternate. If you wish, you can go that way. But I'm warning you, it's a dangerous, dangerous way. Don't go there. I beg you not to go there. Does he command you not to go there? Yeah. What's the difference between a begging and a command? A command is, is not optional. So does God command people to obey him? Huh. Well, no, because he's got, a, got an option. Yeah. He says his commandments come with a question mark, don't they? You have to choose. Yeah. You know, when Joshua choose was getting ready to take the Israelites across the Jordan, what did yeah. he say? He said, you got to choose. Choose today who you're going to serve. Here's, how, here's what my choice is. We're going to serve God, me and my family. Now you choose. So what did they all do? They said they chose God. They chose. Was they forced to choose God? No. Did God order them to choose him? No. No. 
His his uh, commands are really invitations, are they not? Yeah. You know, what's the difference between an invitation and a summons? <laughs> an invitation is a choice and a summons is a yeah. command. Yeah, if you get a summons to appear in a court someplace. You better show up. Are they saying, would you please come to our court hearing? No, they're saying you must come to our court what hearing. What if you don't come? They'll come after you. They'll and send make the police sure out there, there, arrest you to get you in there. That's right. And you will come, or you have to. But an invitation, when you get an invitation to anything, the minute you get an invitation, what do you have to do? Make a choice. Mm -hmm. Shall I go or not? It doesn't make you go. It doesn't say you have to go. It just says, you're welcome, or we would like to have you come if you want to. You're welcome. Please come. But we can't make you come. If you don't want to, you don't have to. That's an invitation. So when the Lord says, come to me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Is that a command or an invitation? An invitation. Yeah. And does everyone come when he says, come to me? <sighs> no. In fact, probably the majority do not, do they? Right. Why not? They're choosing something else. And, and they don't have to, do they? They don't have to come. All right. Nobody has to come to God. I got something else that's more important. Yeah. So that all relates to the number 20. 20 is an invitation. Now we get to the letter of Resh, which means a head. Now, the heads who make a choice, isn't it? Yeah. I put some, <clears throat> a few ideas of what how we use the number, the, the word head. We think of a head mean that you're noggin where your brain is and stuff like that. But it's much more than that. We have on a car what we call headlights. Uh -huh. Why do they call them headlights? Because they're out in front. Well, what does that have to do with being a head? Because <laughs> they're ahead of you. <laughs> they show you what is ahead. You can't define a word by the same word. That's not how you define a word. Why do they call headlights? What do they do for you? They shine light on stuff. On what? What's in front of you. In front of you. They, they point to where you're going, don't they? Yeah. So your head, your mind, your thoughts, they direct where you're going to go, don't they, to some way? Yeah. We have... Um, the word heading. An aircraft is heading for a certain direction. What does heading mean? It means he's got his coordinates put in and he's got a direction he's going. Well, the, the word heading means what direction are you going, doesn't it? Or right. What's your compass point or something? It talks about where you're, where you're going. We had a little saying when I was in the Army here, quite a lot of sergeant walk in and yell, heads up. Uh-huh. What does that mean? It means kind of like you're at a baseball game and somebody says heads up. That means you better look for a ball because it should be flying your way. All right. Could it mean be alert? Be alert, yeah. Or look around and make sure you understand what's going on or listen up. Yeah. So get. let me have your Pay attention. Pay attention, Pay yeah. attention, yes. Can be a warning or could be a somehow a... Uh, urge to to get with something and so the word head means much more than just your brain or your your skull it has to do with your direction your vision what you see and uh could so, be the head of a river head of a corporation yeah, yeah we said headwaters of a river what does headwaters mean it's where where the river starts yeah the or origin of the river yeah. or we have the head of a corporation. What's the head of a corporation? He's the guy that's in charge of making decisions. Yes. Which or, is 20. <laughs> yeah. We use the term a head man. What's a head man? He's the guy in charge. Yeah, he's the ruler. He's the controller. So when resh is a word meaning a head, who's the head of everything? <laughs> the Lord himself. Yeah. So resh has the number 200 with it. So you take authority as number 10. 20, what do you have 20? 
twice. Of you got doubled. Thorn. But the number, the word for ten is esre. That means ten. Uh -huh. The word for twenty is esreim. Yes. <laughs> means more than one multiples of. Yeah, it's it doesn't even mean we in our language we would say it means plural. To have plural, you just have two or more of anything in the plural. But that's not what you have when you have, you put an im on a Hebrew word. It means much more than just two or more. It means it's infinite. It goes on and on and on and on. Yeah. Hashem, you know what the word Hashem means? The name. The name. What's the word for the heavens? Hashemim. Hashemim or Hashemim. So you've taken the heavens, and this isn't talking about a spiritual condition that they sometimes refer to as heaven, which refers to the presence of God. It just means the the universe, the system. So we look out in the dark sky, you're looking at Hashem, but it's called Hashemim. So what, what does Hashemim mean? Heavens? But it just doesn't mean the sky. It means it goes on and on and on and on. <laughs> yeah. You know, how many times have you read about scientists trying to figure out how big the universe is? <laughs> they got it all figured out. We, it goes out this many trillion miles. Yeah. What do you think they got there? Uh, you just got the beginning of it. They don't know what they're talking about. There's no one but God that knows where it goes, does it? That's right. If there is any end to it, we don't know. God himself is infinite. Maybe the universe is infinite. We don't know. But the Hashemim means it goes on and on and on. So Esra means authority. Double Esra, or 20, is Esraim. So what does Esraim mean? A bunch of the Lord's power. I mean, authority. What do you mean by a bunch? <laughs> eternal God, eternally it's God's infinite. power. Yeah. So how much authority are we talking we can't even describe it. How much authority does God have? All the authority. It's infinite. It is no end to it. And then you come to 200, which is resh. 200 is 10 times 20. So if you have 20 representing the, the infinite authority of God, and you multiply that by 10, how much authority are we talking here? <laughs> I mean, it's beyond it's imagination, like... isn't it? We can't even dream of what it is. It's just so powerful. So resh is a picture of God's absolute, infinite authority. And it's called the head. So when Bereshith, what's Bereshith? The beginning, in the mm -hmm. beginning. And it starts off with a syllable that says, the son who is the head of the house, the great house, and he is described by Resh. How much authority does the sun in the great house have? Holy authority. Yeah, doesn't it say someplace that to the Yeshua, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him? Yeah. So how much is all authority? <laughs> it's resh. The, the authority that never ends. Resh is all authority, and it's pictured by number 20. So how powerful the number is 20? It's all the power. It really makes quite a picture of who the Lord is, doesn't it? Now, the enemy has used that number many times. Many of the evil kings reigned for 20 years, or they started reigning when they were 20. A lot of things happened that weren't good that happened for 20. But uh, why would 20 also be a number that represents evil things? Hmm. Well... <laughs> to propose a choice? Well, what's a counterfeit? Something that's not real. It's not the real thing. It's just. But what does it look like? It's trying to look like the real thing. It looks like the real thing. So the enemy can use the number 20 like a counterfeit. Remember, it says one place the enemy can appear as an angel of light. Yeah. If you saw him as an angel of light, what do you think you're looking at? An angel. So what's an angel of light? Well, that's a good one. 
The Lord said, I'm the light. Right. So if you have an angel of light, you've got a, a being that's serving the Lord himself, is he not? Yeah. What would be the purpose of that angel to operate? Give a message from the light. A message or there's lots of different kinds of yeah, angels. Yeah, true, true. Paramedic angels, there's soldier angels, yeah. messenger angels. But if, to represent the Lord. Yeah, they're coming here to serve whatever the Lord's interest was. Yeah. If it's for the Lord's people, it'll always be for the good. If it's coming against Goliath, it'll be for the destruction, won't it? Yeah. So an angel of light is always coming from God, but it doesn't say that Satan is an angel. I said he can appear as an angel of light. So what is he doing when he's appearing as an angel of light? He's being a counterfeit. He's a counterfeit, or he's wearing a costume that looks like an angel of light. Is that, is that true? That's right. So if he's wearing a costume... He may look like an angel of light. If you saw him, you would think, now that's an angel of light. What would you expect to happen? Uh, I don't know. Well, if you saw what you believe to be an angel of light, what do you think would happen? Something good. Something good. <laughs> Something come from God. But if it's really a counterfeit, a mask that the enemy is wearing, what will really happen? Something bad. When... Satan appeared to Eve and, e and Adam in the Garden of Eden. What did they think, or what did Eve think? Well, she considered what he said. Well, what did she think when she first contacted him? This must be a good guy. He's an angel of light. He looks like an angel of light. Yeah. Must be something good coming. So when he says something about anything, what's she going to conclude? Well, must be right. Where does this knowledge come from that she think? From herself? No, where will she think the knowledge oh, come from? Oh, she thinks it's coming from God. It's coming from God. And didn't it mention God? He said, did God really say this? Yeah. I'm here to tell you he didn't really mean that. Yeah. I'm here to tell you what he really meant. What did she think Slipped was happening? Slipped in as a counterfeit. Thought God was changing the rule on her. Either that or she had misunderstood the first time, right? Right. I must not have understood correctly because he told me what he really meant. Yeah. But it was a lie. Yeah. So <clears throat> a counterfeit, even though it may look like the rude thing, it's always a lie, and a lie is dangerous, isn't it? That's right. So if you accept a counterfeit, what are you getting? Somebody gives you a 20 foot or a counterfeit $20 bill, what have you got? <laughs> Nothing. Got, got a, a piece of paper, and if you yeah. try to pass it off, somebody else could land you up in jail, couldn't it? Yeah, that's right. So it's dangerous for you to even have that in your hand or to receive it. So so that number, the evil things are like counterfeit things. They're there, and uh, so the enemy uses those numbers. He can use the number 20, and when you use the number 20, if you listen to him, what are you going to think? That's, that's the authority of God. Yeah, whatever he's saying must be true. Yeah. But if it's not true and you accept it, you're into danger, aren't you? Yeah. Can the enemy use the number 200? He, um, what does 200 mean? The absolute authority? Yeah. What did Pontius Pilate say to the creator of the heavens and earth as he looked him <laughs> right in the eye? What is truth? No, well, Pontius Pilate said that, but he also said, I have power over you, did he not? Right. So we're talking 200. That's the ultimate authority. What did Pontius, what did Pilate claim to have? <laughs> authority over the ultimate authority. Yeah, so in his eyes, who's the greatest authority there is? <laughs> And yeah, when Pharaoh yeah. said, who is God that I should obey him? Pharaoh's using the number 200, isn't he? Yeah. He's saying, I am the ultimate authority. I am Pharaoh, mister. Yeah. Now, you remember uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream one time, King Nebuchadnezzar. Was he a good king or a bad one? Um. He had both characteristics, didn't he? Well, 
When you first read about Nebuchadnezzar, what was he doing? I don't remember. Do he was know? enslaving the Lord's people. He was head of Babylon. Yeah, so Babylon, Babylon represents no good. <laughs> and uh, he had a dream, though, and Daniel was there. And Daniel was the only one in the kingdom that could interpret the dream. Uh -huh. So remember, he went to, it was summoned by Nebuchadnezzar, went to him, and Nebuchadnezzar demanded that he give him his interpretation of his dream. And the dream was a, a giant statue, remember? Uh-huh. Had a head of gold and a chest of silver, and it had bronze legs and clay feet clay mixed with iron, iron for feet yeah. and stuff like that so daniel said to him these are four dynasties that are going to rule the world they're really the history of the world's ruling mm -hmm. so the world was first ruled by the babylonians and he said to nebuchadnezzar you're the head you're that gold head so when he said to nebuchadnezzar you're the gold head what does head mean um the authority? The authority. And gold means something of the greatest value. So how do you think Nebuchadnezzar liked that part of it? <laughs> He's so like, far. this is good. Yeah. I like this. And then, but following you is going to be another dinosaur, dynasty. So the first dynasty was Babylon. That was the world government to start with. Then along came the Persians. So they were the, the next section of it. And then after the Persians came the Greeks. The Greeks were nice guys, weren't they? <laughs> What'd they do? Well, they put their culture off on the whole world by occupying it. What if you were a Jew in the Persian realm? In the Persian? Under the Persian authority, you were Jew. Oh, well, they probably kicked them out. They didn't kick them out, but they forbid them to be Jews. Oh. You could get the death penalty for observing oh, the Sabbath. Yeah. You could not have circumcision. You couldn't have any of the feast days. Anything related to Judaism was a crime under yeah. the Greeks. And they strictly enforced it. You remember who the Maccabees were? Yeah. They were uh, Jews who were patriots to Judaism. And they, uh, they resisted the Greeks. Yeah. But what'd they get for their efforts? <laughs> they got ran up a hill until yeah. they died. So after the Greeks then came the Romans. And how about the Romans? How'd they treat the Lord's people? Not so good. And so on. So anyway, here was these different dynasties representing the world's authorities. And then it said in this dream or this thing that Nebuchadnezzar was talking about, a giant stone fell down out of heaven, it says, and it struck the, the statue on the foot, on the feet. Mm -hmm. The feet were made of iron mixed with clay. Which uh, is unsteady feet. Yeah, and fragile, too. Yeah. You know, it, it, we for, can't, you couldn't mix a... clay with iron. That's no. impossible. But it, it was a dream, so it was... It was iron, but it was fragmented by something that crumbles. It, it was a picture of, why would you do that? Yeah, <laughs> and, it, and it can't really be, but if it were, it would be a very fragile, unstable, yeah. weak situation. So what happens when this giant stone hits it? It crumbles. And, the, and it says the it whole statue collapsed and it just crashing down. ground it to powder and the wind blew it away. Just So... And then it says about the stone, it puts a personal pronoun connecting. It says, of his kingdom, there will be no end. These others represented four kingdoms that ruled the world. They all came to their end, didn't they? Yeah. But of his kingdom, that is of the great stone, there will be no end. And the Lord says, I am the rock. Yeah. So the great stone, what's the great stone then? Yeshua. And it says he is a king and he has a kingdom. And how long will his kingdom last? Forever. The other kings did not last forever. They lasted a while. Yeah. And of course, during their period of time or their, or their phase of the thing, they did their stuff. And it usually was cruel to the Lord's people, anti-God, against truth. But of the, the stone came in and crushed that one down and the wind blew it away. 
Wind. What's the word for wind? <laughs> Same thing as spirit. Yeah. Ruach. Ruach. Ruach Kadosh is the Holy Spirit. So what blew the stone or blew away the dust <laughs> of the it's just the, the spirit, spirit of God. Yeah. So when it's all done, you have only one kingdom left, and how long is that kingdom going to go on? Forever. So could we call that kingdom Resh? Yeah, the well, head I, kingdom. It's the head kingdom. It's the one that has infinite power. The others had a limited power, didn't they? That's right. They had power, but it was always limited. What limited them? They were of the world. They were the flesh. Well, that's true, but what limited them? Because <laughs> they were nothing compared to the power and authority of God. Well, what limited them was the stone that crashed down out of heaven, wasn't it? Yeah. And that crashing came at the work of the Ruach Hadosh, the Holy Spirit, that is what limited their power. So it's just like when Lord told Pius Pilate, yeah, you have some power, but it's under the authority of the Holy Spirit. And when he decides he's done with you, you'll be just like Nebuchadnezzar's giant statues. He'll grind you to powder and the wind will blow the dust away. Now, we look at our world today, we see lots of evidence of the Babylonian Empire still in the world. Do you, do you know what any influence come from Babylon? Hmm. Metallurgy? Perhaps a lot of that. Yes, in fact, that statue <laughs> was, a, was a cast metal statue, wasn't it? Yeah. Remember uh, when uh, the king threw the four Hebrew children, or three, into, yeah, four, four, no, three, into the fire furnace. And that fire furnace had a, had a operating temperature. So it was heated up to seven times the normal temperature. What do you suppose that furnace was for? Smelting stuff? Melting metal, yeah. It was a metalworking furnace. So we see a lot of evidence of the Persians. We see the evidence of the the Medes. They were part of the Persian Empire. We get some of their their uh, mathematics came from there, and a lot of engineering principles. You get down to the Greeks. A lot of our architecture is based on Greek design, and music, and writing. Half our language is Greek language, isn't it? A yeah. lot of words that we say are Greek words. So the the Greeks had a tremendous influence in the world, didn't they? Yeah. They ruled over all of the Middle East for a long time. The Persian king, you know, that was the one that Queen Esther was tied into, said he ruled 127 provinces from India to North Africa. The entire Middle East was under his rule. And then you get down to the Romans finally. What evidence do we have that the Romans ever existed? Oh, their infrastructures are still there. Yeah. Their, their buildings, their coins, their... Their religion? Their, yeah, their villages. And How about the language, too? A lot of our language is Latin, isn't it? Yeah. They right. were the Latins. And uh, how about all of South America and Central America and Mexico? It's all under the influence of Rome, isn't it? Yeah. But remember, the, the last dynasty was iron mixed with clay. Iron represents things that are strong, but clay is crumbly. Yeah. So you mix something crumbly with what's strong, and you got a picture of the Roman dynasty. Yeah. Now, our, uh, our calendar is dated either A.D. or B.C. What was the determination of that calendar? When the Lord was born. Yeah, who who made up that calendar? Who decided to call it A.D. or B.C.? <laughs> well, somebody in the Roman government. Probably right? the Roman government, didn't he? Yeah. So here the whole world, all dates are dated according to what the Romans determined the date would be, didn't they? Yeah. And how many people in the world speak Spanish or Portuguese or Italian <laughs> or French? Uh, lots it's of all them. Latin language, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, so there's plenty of influence. However, at one time, the Romans absolutely ruled the world. You know, they had 
huge armies they went over they just conquered everybody but how much influence world rulers are from Rome nowadays huh only the religious ones you turn on the news who's running everything these days the Romans no who is Americans has got a pretty big hand. They got a big chunk, but that's collapsing, isn't it, under their president? Uh, uh, yeah. Talk about iron mixed with clay. That's right. This country was founded on pretty solid, strong principles. Yeah. Look what's happened to it. It's going to crumble if the rate is going, wouldn't that's you right. think? Oh, yeah. Next week, yeah. the rate is going. But you have the influence of Europe. Yeah. And Europe is mostly Roman influence, too, isn't it? That's right. Without a doubt. Even the Russians, where did the Russians' influence come from? Well, they got R Roman influence as well. They were under the Roman influence, but they broke away from it. Sorry, the Russian Orthodox yeah. instead of the Roman Orthodox. Yeah. And you had the Greek Orthodox, the English Orthodox. Yeah. All of them got their Orthodoxy from Rome, didn't they? That's right. But they decided they didn't like their Pope, and so they decided to rule it their way. But they were nothing but breakoffs from Rome, wouldn't you say? Right. And so they still have a lot of influence in the world. But it's still Slots. pretty weak, isn't it? Yeah. You know, the British tried to keep Israel, keep the Hebrews from going to Canaan back in 1947. Yeah. They were blockading and wouldn't let them go to, to the Promised Land. But what happened to their barriers? That all broke down, too. Yeah. And so can you see that even the European influence is iron mixed with clay? Yeah. So, according to that prophetic picture of the of the giant statue, there were only four dynasties. There was no no others come after that, right. except the great stone that fell out of heaven. Is there any doubt that the great stone is the Lord Himself, <laughs> no. under the power of the Spirit of God? And what did that great stone do? It destroyed every other kingdom. Can you imagine what the world would look like if all the evidence that Babylon, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans was completely blown away where we had no more influence from any of those? What would happen to our language? You couldn't even talk because no. most of what you say is either Greek or Latin, isn't it? It's, yeah. What would happen to our architecture? Half our buildings are designed <laughs> after Greek architecture. Right. Look at all the capital buildings. They all look like Greek buildings, don't they? That's right. That's the very word, capital. Yes. And uh, what about our mathematics, our engineering? Most of that would blow away because that's all designed after the Persians and, the, and those people that came up with these mathematic things. Yeah. Artwork came from Greeks and and all this music, a great deal of the music and everything. Just imagine. All the modes in music are yeah. named after Greek names. Yeah. Just imagine the world with the influence of every one of those former dynasties no longer even in the world. What would the world look like? We wouldn't recognize it. Maybe it'd look something like the Garden of Eden, would you think? <laughs> because all the influence that came from these evil dynasties would be gone. Yeah. And the Lord says in that in that parable that Nebuchadnezzar saw, the great stone destroyed the giant and the wind of the spirit blew it all away. Oh, where's away anyway? <laughs> Something is away. <laughs> Where's it gone? Going? Anywhere but here, right? That's right. So we can't even comprehend it, but he said that that was a picture of what was gonna die Daniel interpreted and said, This is gonna happen. Now we don't know when it'll happen, but it'll happen. What do you think? Yeah. And when it does, there's going to be a change in the world that we can't even comprehend <laughs> hardly. Yeah. All these structures you see would be gone. Where'd the idea of paved roads come from? Probably Rome. From Rome. They're the ones. Why'd they pave roads anyway? Why'd the Romans do that? To get their military moving That's on That's right. Path. So they could move their military to maintain their power. Yeah. What would happen if every paved road in the world was suddenly turned right back into ordinary earth? <laughs> I mean, all where, this, where every piece of equipment far? we got, our our technology, everything would just disappear, wouldn't it? Yeah. And can we can we can imagine? We can try to think about what it might be, but 
is beyond imagination. But who's going to make it all happen? <laughs> the Lord himself. Resh. Yeah, the, head, the race. The head, the number 200, the number 20. So what is number 20 and number 200, and what does the letter Resh all mean? And the Lord himself. Well, they're pretty powerful figures, aren't they? Yeah, they are. So I told the folks at our meeting, I said, from now on, when you're reading your, your Bible and you come to the number 20 of anything, what are you going to be thinking about? Investigate it and see what it has to do with the race. Yeah. So the Lord says, to whom much is given, much is required. Maybe somebody didn't know anything about the number 20 before. When they come into 20, where it says somebody did something for 20 years, what would most people think when they read, that king reigned for 20 years? Uh, that's, what would they say? <laughs> that's a few years. So what? Huh? Yeah, exactly. So what? He reigned for 20 years. What does that do? Well, uh, it does a lot if you understand what 20 is, doesn't it? Yeah. Or if you say it's that further down the road. Jacob worked for 20 years in order to bring life to some people. And you think about it, if Jacob had not worked those 20 years, if he had not gone to to that the place where Laban was and worked for those 20 years, what would have happened if he had not gone? <laughs> none, of the, none of the history of Israel would have happened. What would happen to our concepts of truth? Well, we wouldn't have them. What would happen to salvation in general? It wouldn't be there. So, unless, unless you, you know. So was to, it important for Jacob to be there? Yeah, absolutely, years? Yeah, everything. So what was Jacob doing for 20 years? He was saving the earth. <laughs> he was creating saving salvation. Yeah. Did he have any idea what he was doing? No. As far as he was concerned, he was working for one woman and paying the price for her. And watching sheep. And watching sheep, but his only purpose in watching sheep was to be honest with the man who, who took him on. And what happened when the sheep got stolen or anything happened? Or took a loss. He took the loss. He bore. When the Lord went in Isaiah 53, it says, He took the loss for, for those who were lost in the world, did he not? Yeah. He bore the price. And so that number 20 could represent the Lord bearing the price or bearing the sin of the world, doesn't it? Yeah. So you can see 20 is a picture of the salvation of the Lord and the Lord came here to do they said I came to the world not to destroy but to seek and save what was lost so his whole purpose for arriving here in the world and doing what he did is pictured in number 20 so you think about that you know when the Lord when people read the Bible and they come to a 20 if they just whip on by without any thought mm -hmm. they missed out on something None of those words are put there for no reason. Every one of them has right. a meaning for being. And I've said a lot of times that there's no words in the Bible that are there just to fill in. If the Lord says Samson ruled for 20 years, what was Samson doing for those 20 years? He was establishing the authority of God. That's right. He was doing exactly what the Lord came to do. And it all culminated by destroying all these evil priests of Baal, yeah. which would have brought influence on the world had that not happened, wouldn't it? Right. We had no way to estimate how much damage could those evil priests do if they had been allowed to go on. No telling. Nobody knows but God. But it didn't happen because Samson was there. And the reason Samson was able to do it was he asked God for the strength to do it, didn't he? Yeah. In his present condition, he couldn't do it because he had been so severely wounded and, and broken by the, the evil ones. But he was able to by the hand of God. So God worked in Samson to produce salvation for us, didn't he? Yeah. So you think about all these numbers and letters and the names of these people that were involved. Every one of them had something to do with bringing hope to us. And you think about uh, even the evil ones. Sometimes the enemy uses the numbers and letters in a counterfeit way. 
but even those are allowed to be in order that we might see the power of God, aren't they? Yeah. Just like God said of Pharaoh, I raised you up so I can show my power. If Pharaoh was not there or Pharaoh was a weakling, how would God demonstrate his power to his people? He said, I raised you up so I can show that. So Pharaoh had a reason to be, didn't he? Yeah. Now he didn't know it and he didn't want it, but he was really being used by God, wasn't he? Yeah. If somebody comes to you and says so-and-so is just using you, <laughs> what do they mean by that? He's got an ulterior motive. If he's using you, what is he doing? Taking advantage. For what purpose? For his own purposes. Yeah, for his own purpose. He's using you to boost himself. So God says, I'm going to use Pharaoh. Does Pharaoh want to be used by God? No. He wants to have his own power. When the Lord met the Satan, the demon in the wilderness, remember, it says, the Lord, the Spirit of God drove the Lord into the wilderness, and there he starved him for 40 days. He didn't eat anything for 40 days. Mm. What kind of condition is he in after 40 days with nothing to eat? Vulnerable from a fleshly perspective. Yeah. How's it, what's the longest you've ever gone without eating? The longest time? Mm, at least a week. Have you gone a week without eating anything? Yeah. How'd you feel? <laughs> you feel like taking on a big, no. tough project after that? You, you kind of lie low and just let things... You'd be about as weak as you sleep. can get. Yeah. yeah. Most yeah. people couldn't last that long. Yeah, They'd be dead by that time. It was hard. So here's the Lord. 40 days... Who could survive 40 days without eating anything? They say that's the... After that, your body starts collapsing on yeah. itself, eating itself. It'd be just about as weak as you could even be yeah. if you could even be alive. It's like the so pinnacle. So if you could see a picture of him in the wilderness out there in the southern desert for 40 days, what would he look like if you saw him? Emaciated. Would he be out strutting around, no. looking around? Probably lying down. He'd be laying face down in the dust, just about dead, wouldn't he? Yeah. Couldn't get any weaker than that or any more helpless. But remember, who is he? He's a... He's a re He is Yeah. And here along now, why did Satan go out there? Did Satan say, I'm going to go out there and see what I can do to him? He was there to break him. Why did he go? He was told to told to commanded he to. was driven into the wilderness he was summoned yeah he had no choice god did not invite satan to come out there he summoned him and when he summoned him what choice did satan have he didn't have one did he want to go out there no it says the satan trembles at the very presence of the lord to even come near the lord would be absolutely frightening to satan he does not want to be there, but when he's commanded to come, he has to come, doesn't he? So he came. So what does Satan look like walking up to the Lord? The Lord's laying face down in the dust, almost dead. And here comes Satan. What does he look like? <laughs> does he look like a swashbuckling private pirate? <laughs> he probably looks like an angel of light, doesn't he? No, sir. Why is he coming? To break the Lord? No, he's coming because God summoned him. Oh, okay. What is his plan? What's Now, he hates to come to the Lord because he's so fearful of it. But he sees Yeshua lying down on the ground, nearly dead. Does Satan know who he's facing there? Yeah. If you ask Satan, who is that you're coming to see, what would be the answer? He, he would say it's... It's God himself. It's Resh. Yeah. The ultimate authority that's beyond all imagination. Infinite authority. Yeah. He doesn't look very strong, but who is he really? It doesn't matter what he looks like. Who is he? He's the he, he is who he is. Authority of the universe. So when Satan approaches him, what does Satan look like? A uh, coward. Coward. A very frightened individual. Yeah. And he'd come trembling up to him. Yeah. He would not come voluntarily. He has to come because the Spirit of God has summoned him. So there he is. He's come up toward the Lord, and he's in a, you can picture him just 
It's creeping up there like you'd creep up on a, a wild lion or something. Mm. In fact, the Lord is a wild lion, isn't he not? <laughs> yeah. So here he's creeping up, very, fr very frightening, very fearful, but he can't help it. He has to be there. And so, now what like does the Lord, what does Satan say to the Lord? And why does he say it? Um, he says, you want to make some bread out of these rocks? Well, that's a question. Did he ask him a question? I'm tired. He said, if you really are the son of yeah, God, so it's a, make these stones into bread. It's a uh, if you are. temptation, if you will, to test. Well, why did he say that? Well, from a human perspective, he would expect him to say, no, I am who, who I say I am, and I'm going to prove it to you. Does Satan want to talk to the Lord? No. Then why did he? Because he had to. Why did he have to talk to him? He was commanded to by the, the Lord. told him. The Lord, yeah. The Lord said, I brought you here for one purpose. Same reason that Pharaoh was raised. Why is Satan here? Say what? The same reason that God raised up Pharaoh. Why is Satan approaching the Lord? To show his power. The Lord wants to show who he is. And he's using him. Does Satan want to be used by God? No. He has no choice. He's going to be used. The Lord said, all right, fire at him. He's weak. You're here to destroy him, are you not? That's right. Fire your, fire your pow most powerful weapon. Right now he's, he's dying of thirst and hunger. He hasn't had anything to eat for 40 days. What's the first thing that Satan talks about? He hasn't had anything to eat. Bread. Bread. Bread is the symbol of the essence of living food, isn't it not? Yeah. The Lord calls himself the bread of life. The living bread. If you're feeding on the living bread, what are you getting? Life. You're getting life. So bread represents the very absolute necessity for living. So the Lord says, all right, throw that at him. That'll prove that he's not the son of God, won't it? <laughs> now, Satan says, if you are, whenever he uses a word like that, if you really are this or that, do this, what's he telling him? He's telling him what to do. Well, what's he trying to accomplish here? What is Satan trying to accomplish? Trip him up. By saying, if you are the son of God. He's trying what, to make him do what he wants to do. And what would that do? It'd make him the authority. And that would prove this is not the son of God, right? Right. So he uses the thing that would appeal the most to a starving man. How about something to eat? Mm -hmm. Now, if the Lord, does the Lord have the power to make stones into bread? Yeah. How good a bread would it be? It would be the best ever. He could do it. But if he did, what would happen? Oh, it would, uh, it would, uh, it would have broken his authority. Yeah. He said, if you're the son of God, make these stones into bread. He could do that, all right. But if he did, Whose will would he be serving? Satan's. Yeah. And if he could serve Satan's will, then what would that prove? Then Satan would be the authority. So he's not the race, is he? Right. Satan would become the race. So did the Lord, you know, it's sad that the English translation said he was being tempted. Yeah. That's a false word, isn't it? Right. The Lord cannot be tempted. He said, God cannot be tempted. He doesn't tempt anybody. So if he can't be tempted, then how can the Lord be tempted? In fact, if he could be tempted, what would that prove? He's just like us. Then he's not God. Not the race, yeah. So if he could be tempted, then he's not God. 
So the word that's used in English translation is not the right word. It's too bad it got put in there. Yeah. How'd that word happen to get in there anyway, you suppose? <laughs> Slight deceptions in the in the truth. Who does the deceiving in the world? He's, there's only one that does the deceiving. That's the enemy. I think Satan somehow influenced people to throw that word in there. It should have been tested. A yeah. tremendously different word. Completely different. I have about 20 translations, about two of them have that. Yeah. Tested is a good word. You can test God. You can test anything, can't you? Yeah. But tempting is completely different from testing. It has nothing to do with it. Yeah. And by putting that word in there, they've made the Lord no more than I am. I can be tempted, but the Lord can't. So anyway, the Lord told Satan, throw that at him. So he throws it at him. So what did the Lord answer when he said, if, you're, if you are the son, make these bread, or make these stones into bread. So what was the Lord's answer? He said, man shall not live by bread alone. Where did he get that word? That's from the Tanakh. Or the Torah. Yeah. It's out of the De Deuteronomy, I believe. Yeah. So he quotes from the law. Man shall not live by bread alone. Now, does that mean you're not supposed to eat any kind of food? Symbolized mm -hmm. by bread? No. He didn't say man should not live by bread. He said not by bread alone. Uh, yeah. So if all you get is food, and you get good food, that's okay, but you won't get life for that because what happens to people who eat good food? Well, they die like everybody. They die. Yeah. So good food, no matter how good it is, it cannot give you life. It yeah. can give you a temporary experience for a short time. Give you a little bit of energy. Just like the water that the woman in Samaria was going to get. The water in Jacob's well was good water, but it's only good for one day at a time. It, you had to come back tomorrow, get some more. The next day after that, the next day after that. In the end, you die of thirst. <laughs> so bread alone will not keep you alive. But, but he said, not only bread, but what? But every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Yes. So the word, the word that proceeds from the mouth of God... What's the word that proceeds in the mouth of God? Truth, love, goodness. Well, walk. John said in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So what's the word? Uh, Yeshua. And he said, I am the bread, didn't he, of life? Yeah. So if you're just living on earthly or physical bread, it's okay, but you're not going to live for that. It won't keep you alive. The word that keeps you alive is the living word, isn't it? Yeah. So he throws that back at Satan. So how much, you know, this was a test to see if he would bend. How much did he bend? Hmm. <laughs> he didn't bend at all. Not even. How much effect did that that word, that test, have on him at all? How much it effect? didn't change who he was. Not at all. All, all it did was urged him to throw some law back into Satan's face, didn't he? Yeah. So then Satan didn't give up then. Why didn't he give up? Because he was there to give him all he had. And who made him do it? Uh, the Lord. The Lord says, I'm not done with you yet. That's right. That's the more thing. You get Satan, back over there. Throw another round at him. <laughs> so what does he do again? He throws another round at so him. So what did he throw at him? Um... Uh, he said, uh, he took him to a holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said right. to him, the if you are the son You know of what God. the pinnacle of the temple is? A lot of people don't know what that is. Do you know? Um, the high place. I mean, that's all I know about it. Well, if you've seen a picture, now, none of us have seen the actual old temple. Right. All we've seen is All ideas. All we the Dome of the Rock. Yeah, which has nothing to do with that, but right. even of Israel's temple. Now, we think of a pinnacle. What's a pinnacle? A high point. 
so. like a spy or something. Yeah. But there's nothing to indicate there was any such of a thing on the temple. Nothing that even would resemble a spy or some tall point. I wouldn't think so. What the the Jews there say, the pinnacle was the corner of the wall that held the Temple Mount up, right mm -hmm. near the corner of the western wall. Mm -hmm. And we were right there, and there's a corner where the wall comes together. Mm -hmm. And it's about maybe 70, 80 feet from the top to down to the bottom, and there's just rocks at the bottom. Mm -hmm. They say that's the pinnacle. Huh. So, but if you jumped off of that wall up there, it's nice. about as high as the Captain Cook Hotel or so, and you hit the ground, you're going to be in trouble, aren't you? Yeah. So Satan told him, he takes him up there. He says, jump off. Why? Why would he even be inclined to do so? Um, he's, he's tempting him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. He's not tempting him. Throw that word away. Testing. testing, I'm sorry. All right. So what would be the purpose of throwing yourself down? To prove that you're the son of God because the angels will yeah. not let you come to harm. And where did he get that concept that the angels would keep you from dashing your foot against the stone? Where did that come from? That is from the Psalms. From Psalms. Psalms is the prayer book for the Lord's people, isn't it? Yeah. What right does Satan have to quote anything out of Psalms? He doesn't. Because that doesn't belong to him. That That's not for Satan. That's a prayer book for the Lord's people. So if the Lord did do that, threw himself off, it says right there in Psalms that, that the angels would be there to protect him. Would they be there to protect him? Yeah. Well, we'd like to think that anyway, but, but if he but, did do that... But, but if he did that, he would have lost his authority by then. So why would he do it at all? He'd be doing it at the command of the enemy, That's wouldn't right. he? Or at the That's influence. Right. The, the question world was... might have fallen apart before yeah. then. So you want to prove... You Don't you want everybody to know that you're the Son of God? Here's how you can prove it. Mm -hmm. Does the Lord want to prove anything about himself? No. When does God ever make an effort to prove anything to anybody? <laughs> Yeah, you know, the right. Lord just says, here's the way it is. If you believe that, fine. If you don't, that's your problem. What, what effort does he ever make to prove it? The first word in the Bible is, in the beginning, God created. <laughs> does he try to prove that? No. But here's all these so-called apologists. What's apologists mean? Um, people who are defending God. Yeah, they're trying to prove things. They like to quote Bible verse and try to prove things by it. There's no Bible verse that proves anything to anybody. Is right. There, can you, you know, they have what they call proof scriptures. Right, proof texts. Yeah. Show me one proof script. There's. <laughs> it says in the beginning, God, does everybody in the world believe it? No. If it could be proven, then everybody would have to believe it, wouldn't they? Yeah. But it can't be proven because God does not try to prove it. Faith is not based on something being proven to you. Faith is based on you choosing to agree with God, isn't it? Yeah. And you don't choose because anything's proven. You choose because your heart attitude has been affected by the grace of God. Yeah. And so you just say, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose that way." <laughs> that's, that's so. Beautiful. Anyway, Satan said to him, "Jump off this pinnacle or this high wall, and your angels will, will." protect you from injury and that'll prove that you're really the son of God now do it isn't that what he said yeah and what did the Lord say he said no he said uh, you again it is written you shall not put the Lord your God to the test so you're not going to test God remember what happened when the 12 spies went into ancient Israel who were and they were the Jews wandering in the wilderness. They they weren't wandering, but they led through the wilderness. They came up to the place called Kadesh Barnea, uh -huh. and the Lord said, "Send twelve spies in there to do what? To see what if the Lord was true." So 
So we could say, send them in there to test God. <laughs> so didn't yeah. God tell them to do it? Yeah. So were they right or wrong for doing it? Uh, they could have just said, well, we, we, we trust you, Lord. They could have. But you think about this. My guess is when they went in, they already kind of made up their mind. This can't be true. This isn't real. And yeah. we'll prove that this is not true. And they did, didn't they? They came back and said, yeah, it's everything's like God said, but. But. They're too but we big. can't take it. Why not? Right. Because God himself, big. the Ruach, the rich, I mean, the Resh is not big enough to conquer those giants. Yeah. And so there's no hope. So they'd literally given up on God before they ever came back with the report, hadn't they? Yeah. What they do? They tried to test the Lord, the God. The Lord said, "It's written, you shall not do that." So there again was a word out of Deuteronomy against the enemy: "You can't do this to God. Not allowed." So then, God said to him, "Okay, you got one more, one more round in your clip. What?" Okay. Got one more he, shell to fire. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and okay. their glory. Where in the world is a mountain high enough where he could see every kingdom in the world? Is there any place in the world you know of that you could do no. that? So where's this high mountain that you can see everywhere? I don't know. What in a physical place was it? Can't possibly be. There's no mountain in the world you could get up there and see all the kings of the world. Yeah. So it has to be a realm in the spirit realm. And when it says all the kings of the world, could he see the kingdom of Babylon? Yeah. Could he see the Roman Empire? Yeah. Could he see America? Could yeah. he see Russia? Yeah. Could he see the ancient Chinese? I mean, all the kingdoms are all the, the dynasties that have ever lived on the face of the earth, wouldn't you say? He saw it all. Yeah. How about everybody who lives in that kingdom? Yeah. So what did the Lord see that Satan took him to where he could see that? What did he see? It's all his people that he loves. Right. Just the good guys, right? No, he loves them all. He saw everyone who has ever lived in the world from Adam to the very last man, wouldn't yeah. you say? Yeah. So in whatever realm that is, we can't comprehend that, but the Satan was able to do that. Tells you something about the the limited authority of Satan. He, as limited as it is, still able to do things of beyond imagination. But he takes him up to this place wherever it is. And what did he say about this? He said, "All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me." Okay. So which ones was Satan talking about? He said all of them. Okay, so everyone who's ever lived on the face of the earth from Adam to the last man, he saw them all. He said, I'll give them all to you. As could if he, do, he was the uh, primary authority. Could he do that? No. Why not? Because he's not the primary authority. Does he own any of them? No. They don't belong to, they're not his property. Yeah. They belong to God. And so he couldn't do it even if even if he agreed to. But if he agreed to them, he could say, well, didn't you come here to save these people? Now you've got them saved, so they're all yours. Uh -huh. And who gave them to you? He had. So there again, he's trying to pres uh, presume to have the race on his title, wouldn't he? Yeah. I'm the ultimate authority. I gave them to you. I gave them to you. So if Satan gave them to the Lord, then what has the Lord got? <laughs> Nothing. Well, he's got Satan's property, if that oh, was the yeah. case, wouldn't he? Yeah. Just can't possibly be. So how'd the Lord end that up? Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Okay, Satan didn't want to be there in the first place, do you think? 
Right. He trembles. Now the Lord said, okay, go. <laughs> said, Get out of here. You're out of here. Yeah. So when Satan left, did he go striding off in a cloud of glory, looking like an angel of light? No. He's... What did he look like when he left? He darted out of there. I think he was running for his life. Like it says, you resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Yeah. What does flee mean? It means run what you tell between your legs. Run in terror. It's not a not a casual walking away. It's it's running like a frightened someone who's in terror. Satan was so glad to get away from that. So how much did the Lord bend in all that test? He didn't bend at all. He just proved who he was. Well, it shows one thing. He was the race. He is the race. He is the race. The enemy tried to destroy that. Now, but, you know, remember, we can't use that word tempt. That's not the word. It's right. just the, absolutely the wrong word. And uh, when it, there's even another place where it says the Lord was tempted in all points like we are. Yeah. It does say that. That's one of the apostles' writings that, that says that in our English translation. But if that were true... Then what does happen to the other translation? It says God cannot be tempted right. and never tempts him. But then how can he James, say he's yeah. tempted like we're tempted? Yeah. James explains that. He says a man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and, and enticed. enticed. How much lust does the Lord have? The Lord doesn't have lust and he's not enticed. The enemy tried to entice him. How far did he get with that? <laughs> he didn't get anywhere. And Now the Lord was starving. He could have certainly lusted after bread if he had lust. Didn't do that. No. Is there anything else that he could have lusted for if he were tempted like we are? Lust for power? Yeah. But Lust. if we changed the word that's to his proper word and said, the Lord was tested in all things like we are, yet he did not fail. By implication, what does he say about us when we are tested? We fail. We fail. And because we fail and he does not fail under the same testing, then what happens when we need help? We can go to somebody who has not failed. He hasn't failed, so he can help us. Yeah. If he failed the same way we failed, Why then that would be like he? a drowning man trying to get help <laughs> from another drowning guy. Yeah. If you're down in the water drowning and another guy comes by and he's drowning, you grab on him, what happens? You both go you down. You both drown because you drown each other. Yeah. So to say the Lord was tempted like we are is completely wrong. But if it says he was tested like us, we failed the test. He passed the test. Therefore, we can call for him to help, and he's able to help because yeah. he can pass the test. Superhero. Or he did pass it. Yeah. But can you see what that does, the word tempt? It just, yeah. It's just so wrong. It's really a sad thing that millions of people have bought into that idea that he was tempted. It's just like when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he prays, not my will but yours. People have thought, He's trying to weasel out of going to the cross because it's such a horrible thing to him. One last bag. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, if that were true, then he'd be just like we are. That's a lot of the we, other things wouldn't have been true. That's right? right. But if we can grasp the idea that he said, I am your servant. Servant doesn't have a will. We're not doing anything based on what I want. We're only doing one thing is what you want. And so not not me, not me, not what I want. It's not that what I want is different from what you want, but I'm a servant, and a true servant does not have a will of his own. If a true servant does anything based on his own will, what's happened? He's exercised his will. Well, what did that make him? <laughs> not a servant anymore. Not a servant. He's self-motivated. Does what he wants to do. Servants don't do what they want to do. What do servants do? Do what the master wants. So the minute you bring my will into it, you've made me into anything but a servant. And if, if the Lord said, don't do what I want to do, do what you want to do, because my will is different than yours, then how can he say I and the Father are one? That's right. If he says I and the Father are one, do it mean that my will is different from his will? <laughs> God would be a schizophrenic, wouldn't it, the word mean? <laughs> yeah. He'd yeah. be a real mixture. It can't be that way. So there again, that's another sad twist of words that have made millions of people get confused. You know. So he gives humankind a choice. Yeah. But Yeshua was there to serve. Yeah. To show us how to yeah. do that. 
and he didn't have a choice to do. I mean, he was sent by the father, just like Joseph was sent by the father to go check on the brothers. Yeah. Joseph did not discuss with the father whether or not he should do it. The father says, do it. He just does it. Why? Because he's because an obedient son. He obeys the father, and same way with the Lord. So. And, it, and you know, it's the religious side of things that make you want to undo some of those yeah. other truths yeah. in order to understand what you think is yeah. you're seeing. And, uh, but we don't have to be, be the, the servant. We have to just know who the servant is That's right. and, and walk in his way. You know, the one place the Lord says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. I don't do things the way you do it. You would look at some horrible approaching thing like the crucifixion and try to get out of it. Yeah. But my ways are not your ways. I don't yeah, do it that way. That's right. When did he determine to come to the crucifixion anyway? <laughs> Before the foundation of the world. So he's been planning this since we had imagined no idea how long this has been or when. But since before anything was created, he had already planned this all out. Now he's going to back out of it at the last minute or try to. It makes no sense. Yeah, it does. And you can't sneak up on God. Some people say as he saw the day approaching, like it got more and more horrible as he got closer to it. I don't believe that for a second. Do you think he knew all about the agony from the beginning? Yeah. Nothing's new to him. So, you know, all this idea is makes God out to be no more than what we are. Maybe a little stronger, but not much more than we are. Yeah. Thinking the same way we do when he clearly says, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And uh, so the more we recognize who God is, and it's our understanding is so trivial, you know, compared to what must be there. But that number 20 in the letter Resh give us some idea of how infinitely great that all is, huh? Yeah. Amen. Well, I'm about ready to go home. What do you think? Yeah, let's warm this car up and yeah. take it on down the road. Okay. What time of night is it anyway? It's about 7.15 probably, I'm guessing. I know it's after 7. Been out for two hours, I find. Huh? Yeah, we we definitely going for two hours. Okay. Well, it's fun, though. Oh, it's, yeah, it's about 7. Yeah. Okay. That was good. Yeah. What are you doing with all these amazing things we talk about? <laughs> I'm posting them to your YouTube channel. What does that mean? It means it's what I do. I, uh, like for instance, today at the beginning, we said some personal things. Yeah. I cut out the personal stuff. Okay. Because I think that's appropriate. Yeah. Um, so what I do is, uh, you know, if there's any editing, I, I do that. And basically the way I prepare it is I put it on my, my movie maker and I get a picture and, uh, get a picture of a cup of coffee because I okay. call these our coffee meetings. And, uh, and then I put our names on there, the date, and uh, the topic at hand. And, and, you know, for the last 20, yeah. it, it's been the Hebrew number and letters series. So who gets that then? Um, well, okay, so I put that out there, and I put the, the audio there. And... It's just, you know, the picture's just a, a placeholder because it's all about the audio. Yeah. Because there's hardly a place where you can just put audio stuff. Yeah. But you can put videos on YouTube for free. So, um, so I put the video up and, you know, to make it available. And there's, you got about 30 people who have sub subscribed. And since I've been putting these, you've had a, a response uh, some guy said, thank you, sir. <laughs> wow. 
and uh, so somebody's reading it. Huh? That's right, and uh, you know I I refer to you a lot when I talk to my friends, and and uh, I I've had a friend recently to listen to one of them. I told him I said, yeah, Jim talked about this the other night. So, well, my thought on the whole thing, I just pray that it'll be a benefit to somebody that be listening up. Well, no idea who it might be, but <laughs> well, you know, one of them's me. So, you know, since we've been meeting together, it's been many years now. Um, almost every week of the last what five years? Yeah. And uh, you know, minus the time we were in Kentucky, but I've got some of your sermons from then. Yeah. So uh, anyway, you know, you've repeated a lot. But it's good for me to uh, <laughs> to repeat it because it. it uh, well, how many times does a book repeat things? So, yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, because the the way you present it is, I, I've said it before, is that that uh, what what you do is more like. The oral history yeah. that the Jews through the centuries passed on, yeah. because midrash, huh? yeah, <laughs> because you've captured it yeah. inside of yourself, and the way you present it is not really like uh, you would read in a book. Yeah, and what that's done for me is it's made me realize, you know, because the faith. <laughs> that I was passed down to was completely read in a book. Yeah. And it, and it had a lot to do with the way you think, the way that you present what you read. Yeah. And, you know, because that's what a preacher does, you know. Well, you know, talking about repeating, prayers give us today our daily bread. So we just had bread yesterday. Now we get bread today. <laughs> What's the daily bread today? Going to be about the same thing as it was yesterday? Yeah might be some new things but when you eat the same thing every day you're repeating a lot yeah but you know I've told you this before but a lot of people take that prayer give us our daily bread and they're thinking right back to food again yeah yeah I said you know you go into a restaurant when we did in the old days before the corona you go into a restaurant and you see a bunch of people in there sitting at a table and these waiters are bringing the food. And they notice over in the corner there's a family, and they, you can see that they're praying for their food. Yeah. The rest of the people are not. They, every one of them eats, whether you pray or not. Yeah, that's right. So if you pray over your meal, it doesn't make your meal a bit better than the others. The same stuff. <laughs> so when he said, give us today our daily bread, he's not talking about restaurant food. You're going to get that whether you pray or not. But what kind of bread is it that you really need every day? That Yeshua bread. Yes. In fact, most of us eat too much, and you could miss a meal or two. It wouldn't hurt you a bit. It sure wouldn't hurt me. But how long can you go without the bread of life? <laughs> Can't what day live do you need that on? Every day. You need it every day. And if you don't as get it. As long as it's called today. And if you, you don't it. get it one day. That doesn't mean you die, but do you take a loss for not getting it? Yeah. So you need it every day. If you don't get it, it weakens you. It makes you more vulnerable to the deceit of the enemy. Yeah. It'll it'll make your day discouraging or or frightening or or at the worst even malicious to somebody else or something. Yeah. So we need that bread every single day. So when he says, "Give us the day our daily bread." I don't believe it has anything to do with food, physical food. But yet, a lot of people do think it does, but I don't think so. But is it all right to, if you're hungry to pray for something to eat? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But when he says, give us our daily bread, I don't think he's talking about food at all. When he says, forgive us our debts or our trespasses, Well, he said, I've already forgiven you. Why do you have to ask to be forgiven for something he's already done? Hmm. I think 
he wants to walk he wants us to walk through that process to uh, keep reminding where mercy comes from yeah and when he says uh, lead us not into temptation when has God ever led anyone into temptation he doesn't then why ask him not to do something that he's never done and never will do why would you ask him not to do it it's more like you do not lead us into yeah. temptation yeah they worded it wrong. They put the put the punctuation in the wrong place. What it should say is, you're not the one that leads us into temptation. Who does that? You're the one that delivers us from the evil one. Yeah, the enemy, Satan, he does that. But you're not the one that does You're the one who saves us from it. Yeah. So what are we doing there when we say that? Just switching it around a little bit. Yeah, we're acknowledging him that he is the Savior. You're not the one that's causing the trouble. You're the one who saves us from it. To say, don't do it, that makes no sense at all, does it? Right. Don't lead us into temptation. Never has, never will. It's a useless prayer, isn't it, if you do that? Yeah. He says, you're not the one that does that, so thanks to God, you're the one that says that there is one who does lead us into temptation if we listen to him. Yeah. But it's not you. So it's really, you know, the Lord says, if you acknowledge him, he will acknowledge you, so... One place says, in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. So that prayer is nothing but acknowledging God for who he is. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. it really doesn't ask him to do anything. It just says, I'm recognizing that you're the one that does all these great things, and I'm giving you thanks and praise for that, and uh, expecting more of it. Yeah. But I'm not asking you to do something that, that you don't need to be asked about. You know. Yeah. So, again... That was, that's the problem with our translation a lot of times, you know. And I'm not condemning the guys that translate. I know they, they've probably done a pretty good job and they mean well. But there's always a risk that you can get words twisted. So yeah. that's why it pays to look up what it really means. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a little extra doing to do that. But you got to read across everything and make yeah. sure everything stays true. Yeah. Like, like that word temptation, if you yeah. if you put that in there, it messes up some other stuff. Yeah, it sure does. Yeah. A lot of places were just an error in translation. And I have a feeling that the, the translators, the, the, the ones who began this, the enemy is always there trying to confuse or yeah. mix up something. That's the way. Of course, by the grace of God, a lot of that is protected, but yeah. still there's a risk there. Jim. Well, thank you very much for thank coming. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Yeah. It's good. I guess our five o'clock time's still working out, huh? Works good for me if it does for you. Well, good, yeah. Yep. I'm going to miss your supper, but. No, I don't miss it. You can get some later. They, they, they put it on a plate for me. <laughs> I'll probably go home and mix up something myself. Well, have a good one. And okay. Priyatna appetita. Yeah. Like they say in the.